The mapping project is one of the key projects for the open co-op. We see this as super important just because we want to be able to visualize and actually see and connect with all the other people that share the same vision as we do, that are working on trying to create a more progressive and inclusive society. And we don't really mind whether they're co-ops or social enterprises or NGOs or charities, whoever they are, as long as they share the same vision and they're working on the same thing, then we need to be able to see them within the same space. Um, and the mapping project for us is so key because it's really obvious that once you've got a map and you've got people listed, within a directory or visualized somehow, and you can see the relationships between them, then you can build so much more from that. You can imagine being able to instantly trade with anybody on that map or in that directory. You can imagine being able to do that with an alternative currency. And then immediately you actually do have an alternative economy. That's really where we're heading, and it's why we see the mapping project as such an essential part of the process of getting there. So this is the kind of overview introductory session, and after this session, the same gang here are going to move into the workshop space and continue the discussion, but much more hands-on so that you can all get involved a little bit more. And part of the objective of that is to end up, hopefully, with a steering group of people that are interested in taking the mapping project forwards. We're gonna hear from each of these lovely people about their different projects that we're working on and trying to yeah, you unite some of them through this steering group. Um, if you want to keep up to speed, then um, the Open Co-op are going to continue to monitor and report and help and assist with this project any way we can. And if you go to open.coop and then forward slash collaborate, it's one of the items in our main menu. There's a list of five projects that we're working on, and we will be working on for the next year, and one of them is this conference. Another one is the mapping project, and there's this whole series of open notes there which like, document all the different mapping efforts that we've found all the way around the world. Um, and you'd be welcome to contribute to that. It would be really good. So without further ado, I shall pass you over to Louis Cousins, who's the project officer from Corps Europe. Good morning. Thank you. Oliver for the invitation. I'm a project officer at Cooperatives Europe. Uh, it's the first time I speak in this conference. I'm very happy to do so. And uh, what I was proposing to Oliver was to tackle this um, topic, this uh, challenge of mapping the co-op economy through a concrete project that I've, we've been working on, which is very tech-related. So uh, we, will, we will go through uh, the why first, I would like to come back on, on our initial idea, then develop on the project and present you some possible next steps. So why mapping? As I said, I uh, work for Cooperatives Europe, so it's great when I, my, my presentation usually starts with these great figures. Uh, I'm not only Louis speaking for myself, uh, we represent one, a total of, of 180,000 co-ops around Europe. It's uh, 140 million members in total, so one European out of five is a member of a cooperative. And we, if we aggregate all the t turnover that you guys are producing every day, we end up with 1,000 1, billion euro total annual turnover, which is the uh, aggregated G GDP of four European countries. So when we come to the European Commission with these figures, it's, you know, it's a bit boom. Okay, we have the right to be here, and it's good for you to, to listen to, uh, to us. Um, to get this data, we had an employee working uh, half-time for six months, contacting each of our members, getting the data, and these are only estimates. So we, don't, we, we, we did not go on the field and asking everybody, are you a member of a cooperative? First, it would not work because some people do, do not know that they are members. And second, uh, it would be uh, too much of effort. But we ended up with this data, which is great, and which is a lot of work. Now that uh, we are entering the digital era, uh, collaborative economy, uh, we want to go to the commission, European Commission and show something like this. But when we talk about platform cooperatives, a great idea, a uh, great sustainable uh, model, well, we end up with no data. We don't know how many we are. We don't know who we are. We don't know how many employees we, how many people we hire, and so on and so forth. There is this great map of the Internet of Ownership, which is our main reference, and we always talk about this. But it's uh, a map. 
it's a map of the projects uh, we know that exist, we cannot really use them as quantitative or, or, or qualitative data. So it's a bit of a challenge for me when I go to the European Commission, you know, like it's, uh, it's, it's hard for me to, to offer something against Google, for instance, and have our voice heard, although we manage in some way. Anyway, so this is the basic uh, situation. This is a situation where we are, and I think this is what Oliver was trying to introduce. So uh, we ended up with this uh, means for end project, which uh, I will very briefly introduce you. Means for end, uh, with means for end, we want to foster a more fair and more sustainable collaborative economy with transformational and collaborative ecosystem. Sounds great. I think it's pretty much in line with what was discussed so far. How we want to do so? So what we propose is to develop, to provide an online platform which would provide a one-stop source to platform co-op goods and services. So if you access this platform, you know which goods and services are provided by the cooperative. So it's good for the consumer to, to, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, prefer a cooperative good against a capitalistic good or service, but also provide a supportive environment for the cooperatives and practitioners. So it's not only for consumers, it's also for us to be able to uh, do better. Okay? The core feature we wanted to develop is a digital infrastructure based on open standards and interoperability. Basically, what we wanted to do first, we wanted to classify, to know what, is, what exists in the field. So again, map the ecosystem. Go to see who does what, where, who wants to do what, how they do so, uh, and so on and so forth. We want, we want to connect these platforms through a, a cooperative idea, a co-op a co ID, so make these platforms able to interact, connect through an API, so develop an API, and which would enable the uh, standardization and exchange mutualization of data among these platforms. Then, once we know who exists, and once we can develop this common infrastructure for the cooperatives willing to integrate, let's say, the, the platforms willing to integrate, we could actually integrate them, providing a cooperative ID service. So the, co the, the, the user would be able to access through, I don't know, when you go to, to Google, for instance, you, you access your Google account, you, you access with one common account, you are able to access uh, all the services, including now Uber or, and, uh, or all the, 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 the technologies uh, connected to, to Google behind. So it would be the, the same stuff. You have your cooperative ID, you connect, you have one account, you connect and you have access to, you know all the services that exist behind. I know that in my neighborhood there is, uh, I don't know, a cooperative, a cooperative shop, for instance. I know that there is a cooperative uh, taxi service. I know that there is, um, whatever cooperative university, and instead of creating one different account for each cooperative, I access all these services through the same cooperative ID. And lastly, uh, experiment on this basis, uh, EU, uh, a common marketplace. So, what we need to develop this is data. We need to understand who does what, as I said several times. We need to, in order to be able to develop a tailored infrastructure and provide an overview uh, to citizens, policymakers, and practitioners. But with this common uh, infrastructure, what is good is that the infrastructure itself provides data. So you do once the mapping, and then the idea is to have the, 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 all the platforms connecting to the infrastructure. So then you know, because you have the tool referencing automatically who does what and provides what. So it's also a good thing because it, it enables exchange and mutualization of information. You share the accounts connected to, to this. But for us and for the, the whole ecosystem, for practitioners, we know how many we are and what we do. Okay? Uh, do you know the concept of success story? What, what is the opposite? Fail? Fuck story? I hear, some, I hear sometimes. So this project was not funded because the European Commission decided that it was not innovative. Uh, 
so we are looking for 1 million euro. Uh, but the concept is available. So we, we have um, a concept, we have an application which is written, we want to open source it, so make it available for anyone willing to use this uh, approach. Uh, we, have, we had consultants, developers, uh, uh, designers working on this for months, so it's, it's quite valuable per se. But what I would mainly propose is that when we talk about mapping, it's great to have mapping. We, we map, we, as cooperative umbrella organizations, we map every day, we map always, we map many things. It's just that I think with uh, new technologies, we have the opportunity now to think mapping in a strategic way. Mapping as a first step in order to get data, share data, and develop the infrastructures in order to, for us to systematize the data production, the data mutualization. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you can hear me, I think. Uh, my name is Tom, and I am here from DotCorp. So I'm going to speak about two different things, and a lot of these are going to lead on to what Colm will be speaking about, uh, sorry, Colm, uh, at, uh, at the end of uh, my talk as well. Uh, so let me just start off. So the two things I'm going to be talking about, one is about uh, what DotCorp is and how it works, and then the second one is how it feeds into the mapping economy as well. So I work for .coop as a top-level domain. This was launched in 2001 and was specifically for the cooperative movement. This was back when the internet was relatively, compared to today, young and was quite small in terms of both the number of people that were using it, the number of people that were online, and in terms of how many domain extensions were allowed by the internet regulator, which was ICANN. The .coop domain, together with the .cooperative mark, in that case, was aimed, excuse me, to take advantage of the powerful medium of the internet, not only for businesses, but also for life in general and for day-to-day -day applications. So as you can see, the cooperative movement is huge and ever-growing, and every day more and more organizations are taking to the internet for all sorts of things, to both market, to educate, to connect, uh, to do business, and even more. Diversity, difference, from a tiny little electricity cooperative in the American Midwest, all across to massive federations uh, that you have out in Asia. So what is it that can bring together this massive diversity and difference within the cooperative movement? And what can bring together this color and range that we have? It's one of our greatest strengths in the cooperative industry. So if we imagine that every cooperative in the world was linked together by a, a sort of a, a brand, a common language that we could all speak online, this is where .coop is uh, stepping into place. So we believe, with that vision in mind, that if every cooperative had a common .coop URL and each member used a .coop email address, so their email address would be, say, a name at business.coop, then the cooperative movement would have a massive internet presence and would also have a media program that would be worth billions. The .coop domain is designed to contribute to this vision, and the internet is huge. 4.1 billion estimated users, according to the internet world stats, are currently online. Our domain was created as a pioneering concept to ensure that the cooperative movement has its own place within that massive scope. And we created that namespace to take advantage of this very real space online. as you can see from the, uh, the, the image there. There are over a 1,000 different web extensions or top-level domains on the internet right now. You can have virtually any ending that you want to your domain name. You can have .music, you can have .shop, you can even have .ninja, if you think that accurately represents you or your, your business. So .coop is a very valuable real estate for the cooperative movement on the internet, and we own this space as a movement. It is there for our community to take advantage of, and it's available just for us. So why is this exclusive namespace important for the cooperative movement? For a number of reasons. First of all, it's a statement of intent, and it offers a high visibility to co-ops in their internet presence. 
And it tells people, importantly, at a glance, that an organization is a cooperative. It is a brand that links each cooperative from any size and any sector within the wider global community. And most probably one of the most important points is that it is only for verified cooperatives as well. So .corp will verify a cooperative, and together with that cooperative mark, it becomes the logo of the cooperative movement worldwide. So talking about the mark, there you can see the, uh, the mark in blue there. It comes in many different colors. You've probably seen this uh, logo on many different applications, products, online, all sorts of different places. Studies have shown that a majority of people trust cooperatives over other forms of business. However, we are still aware that a wide variety of people in the wider public are still, by and large, unaware of the cooperative business model's advantages. By linking this with a cooperative mark, the dot .coop domain then becomes part of a package and a badge that belongs to the wider movement with a particular defined identity. So this then takes me on to the mapping project. Therefore, we've decided that if we can unite cooperatives on the internet under a clear, precise message, then what we are doing is we are empowering everybody who has a choice to choose a more ethical and a more sustainable type of business. And it doesn't end there. Because using a dot co-op contributes to the ever-increasing knowledge of the cooperative community and links organizations together under a database. As Colin will go on to talk more about, we are working together with the Solidarity Economy Association because DocOp can see that by publishing our data set that we naturally uh, accrue through our business, that if we publish this in a particular way that links together with a format with a lot of other organizations, this then contributes to a growing resource that is available to the movement at large. This would provide opportunities for all sorts of things from research, to other mapping projects, and ultimately and fundamentally ends with bringing cooperatives together, putting them in touch, and linking them as well. So thank you very much, uh, and look forward to having any questions you might have about the .coop. Who here has heard of the Digital Life Collective? A few hands. And any members in the audience give a big shout? Ooh, at least one member of the audience. Excellent. Well, I, the presentation I'm giving today, I'm Laura. I'm one of the co-founders of Digital Life. Um, it's very much from the collective as a whole, and in particular from the mapping team that we have. So any errors are all mine. Any good work is all theirs. So Digital Life, um, I should say, we do have the .coop as well. We're not just the .com, although certainly if you're trying any of the more fancy URLs, um, you do need the .com. The .coop just takes you to our homepage. <laughs> We are a fairly new cooperative. We set up last year, and our dream is to have a way that we can provide people with everyday internet services that they can trust, that are private, decentralized, and support our own equality and accessibility. And anyone can join, so do get involved. And we do that by researching, supporting, developing, and funding technology that we think we can trust. That's our formal statement, and uh, we have big ambitions, so do get involved if you would like to help. So, mapping. Mapping is a key part of our work because we need to know what technology is out there that we trust today, what technology might be coming along, and what are the organizations we can be working with because we know that we can't do this alone. It's a collaboration, so we need to know what's going on in the wider world. And maps are a great way to understand the kind of complex territory we're talking about here, a rich landscape of organizations, projects, individuals, technologies, and so on. And there's lots of different ways you can use them, from diving in to find out the details about a single organization, analyzing the landscape, perhaps in our case, spotting gaps and opportunities where we can do something more, and also start to think about what might be, joint, what might be common factors that align projects on a map, maybe shared challenges where there's an opportunity for something to come and ease the path a little way. So this is our ecosystem directory, um, and I'll show you the URL for this in a moment. Um, and I think the interesting thing here is we're actually doing several different maps at the moment. Um, so we're using Qmu. Um, for those of you who might be purists, we know that Qmu is centralized and proprietary, um, but it is very much built with the shared spirit, along with our ideas about technology we can trust, and it's a great tool for this. So, Diving into a little more detail, you can see here some of the maps that we are starting to develop. And I'm going to talk about them 
one at a time. There's three main maps. There's our map of tech we trust. That's up at the, the top left there. That's things that we actually may or may not trust, but we think we probably trust. Things that are private, decentralized, and support equality. We've got the decentralized tech map, which I'm going to talk about a bit more, and a responsible tech map as well. So here's tech we trust. You can see a little bit of the sort of power of the Qmu engine here. Um, on the right, this shows you some of, well, you may or may not be able to see actually, because it's pale and white. But anyway, um, some of the different kinds of elements and things that we have in the map. And it's kind of echoing the criteria that we have for what is tech we trust. You can cluster it in different ways. You can kind of see here you've got alpha tech, beta tech, latest release, and some things where I think we probably don't have any information. And this is really good to start showing, start navigating that complex territory and finding your way around. And you can dive in a little bit more here. You can see one organization with several linked projects. And all of this world is socio-technical. It's not just about technologies that might depend on each other or integrate each other, particularly open source. It's also about the relationships between organizations and people. And we can sort of help see and catalyze some of that with our map. Here's a slightly more crazier version. And this is the decentralized tech map. We've got the URL there on the left. Um, and I've chosen to connect this by areas of work. So it does look a bit of a mess. But it's quite interesting to see how there are some hot spots and some perhaps slightly more neglected areas. This is our map of the decentralized web. This is the first map that's letting projects to be added directly. So rather than by our own mapping team, anyone can go and add their own project. So it's a really decentralized effort. And we're going to be launching this map. It's really exciting at the Internet Archives Decentralized Web Summit, which I think is next week, very soon. Um, but there's still time to get on the map. Our cutoff date is going to be July 29th. So um, if you're a decentralized web project, please do add yourself so you'll be on at launch time or come and speak to one of us if you're having any difficulties or if you're at the conference, we'd love to see you. Also, just to dive in briefly, I'm not going to show you the whole map. This is actually one of my other hats, Dot Everyone, which is a think tank championing responsible technology for the good of everyone in society. And we've been working with Digital Life to put together a map, particularly focusing on the responsible tech field in Europe. Um, it's actually, I think it's launching today, so keep an eye on, on Twitter. Um, Dot Everyone commissions the Digital Life Collective's mapping lead, Christina Bowen, who unfortunately can't be here today, um, to map the responsible tech sector in Europe. So we've got all kinds of things from ethical tech activists, digital rights policy groups, um, academics who are working on things to do with cybersecurity, the Responsible Robotics Foundation, all of these great organizations who are trying to get a better tech industry and better tech out there. So that map is coming soon. Um, this is why we're doing it. Ignore all the technical stuff unless you're a nerd. I just put it there because I'm sure someone wants to see the technical detail. We think maps are useful, particularly when they're interoperable and when they are decentralized in their curation. Because there's no point in making a map and then letting it age and stagnate. It's got to be maintained. It's got to be live and up to date. And if it's not useful, it won't be maintained. So we're hoping that this is going to be useful. And the session after this is going to be very good for taking that forward. And we very much want to be able to represent the richness of organizations and projects here. Things probably won't sit within just a single map. They'll have presence in a number of different worlds. So presence in tech we trust, maybe presence in cooperatives and so on. So sort of links which are really important to draw out. I'm going to be really controversial now. I don't really believe in linked data that much. We do talk, some of the conversation I think following on from this is going to be about linked data. Um, but I used to work in open government data and also quite a bit of work in open research. And boy, was there a lot of RDF out there that no one wanted. You'd spent ages making beautifully crafted ontologies and putting the data into it, and you'd create it, and everyone was like, yeah, can I just have a CSV file? Because I know what I'm doing with CSV. So I, think it's a little, I have a little bit of skepticism here about linked data. I think it's very easy to do if you've got data that is absolutely crystal clear and not debatable, like the date of founding. Maybe that's something you can agree on. But the moment you start talking about other things, like tags or sectors or categories, it's tough because everyone has a different perspective. Some of you will remember HSBC used to have adverts in airports, like Heathrow Airport, and you'd walk down, and they'd have pictures, and they'd show you the same photo twice with different captions. You remember those? It'd have sort of a picture of a 
I'm going to pick an unfair thing. I don't think our youngest uh, attendee is here today, but they have a picture of a baby, and the first caption would say, you know, bundle of joy, and the second caption would say, oh, no sleepless night, it's a nightmare. And that, for me, is an example of why RDF can really struggle. Everyone has different perspectives on the same thing, and if you try to characterize it with too rigid an ontology, you lose that, and you lose, therefore, the belief in what you're doing. Anyway, this is probably the most important slide. That's the URL. Go check it out. All of our maps are linked to there. Um, and yeah, get involved. Thank you. Colin Massey um, from the Solidarity Economy Association. We're a small multi-stakeholder co-op uh, based in Oxford. Um, and our mission is to promote uh, the solidarity economy movement in the UK and help connect us to uh, the international solidarity economy movement. Um, thankfully, I have been warned that uh, Laura was going to sort of uh, prepare some uh, alternative perspectives on linked open data. So th thanks for the heads up on that one. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we do um, a variety of projects. We have uh, one of our biggest projects is linking cooperatives in um, uh, the UK with cooperatives in Syria. Um, and this linked open data for the mapping solidarity is another one of our big projects. So the solidarity economy, what, what is that? Um, the solidarity economy is actually a social movement. It's actually a movement of movements comes from South America, um, but it's now getting well established in, in, in Canada, Spain, Italy, and starting to sort of guess, get recognition in, in the UK as well. Um, uh, and we're a member of RAPES. RAPES is a uh, network of networks of social and solidarity economy organizations, and we're one of, the, one of two uh, UK members of that organization. Yeah, so the... the so the solidarity economy movement is um, a very values-centered movement, um, derives an awful lot of its values, they overlap with the co-op movement's values and principles, um, but has, it has quite a few differences as well. So it's very focused on economic participation, very, um, economic democracy is very much at the heart of it. Um, that slide should have a line through GDP <laughs> and not BGDP. So the solidarity economy uh, movement uh, sort of recognizes it actually measures of traditional measures of economic well-being are very, very flawed, so particularly GDP. Um, uh, it recognizes the informal economy, um, and it's radical. It, it advocates for system change. Rather than just building better co-ops within our current economic system, we need to change the system to solve the major problems that, that face us. Um, there we go. So what are we mapping? Um, there's so many things we could map, and I've, so Laura, it's obviously touched on so many different things that we could map. Um, we are focusing in our project um, on mapping solidarity economy initiatives, so organizations and projects. So some co core essential information about solidarity economy initiatives and projects. Uh, um, and of, of which there are many different types, kind of from um, yeah, credit unions to CSAs um, to informal uh, yeah, volunteer collectives. Um, so we think there's, so we, over the last few years we've been studying this, uh, last two, two, two to three years, we've been looking at how we can contribute to this, to this mapping project. And our vision was to contribute to making the solidarity economy more discoverable. That was one of the key words we, we, we used when we're thinking about what we could contribute. Uh, and we studied the different approaches that people had to mapping the solidarity economy. Um, and many kind of fell, fell, fell short, um, uh, kind of... So such a variety of different approaches, such a variety of different taxonomies and ways of describing solidarity economy initiatives. Many projects short-lived, they get a bit of money, they get a bit of energy, but then those maps, maps die. Um, and often there's single modes for data entry into, to contributing information into, the, into those mapping projects. They um, are, uh, yeah, there, there aren't enough ways in which you can contribute information to those uh, projects. And there's tons, there's so much that doesn't get mapped. Um, and the approach we've, sort of, we've been developing has sort of four, four aspects. Kind of there's, a, there's a technology aspect, um, licensing, um, and the need to tackle, it's a recognition that we need to tackle this problem on multiple scales. We can't have a one-size-fits-all one approach to sort of mapping the, mapping the solidarity economy. Um, and there's some quite different approaches required to get different types of data. Um, and governance. And if we, we, the Solidarity Economy Association, we work with with RAPES, which is a representative body um, on, on this project, but there's, there's a need to govern this work. We, we 
we're sort of plowing a certain path at the moment, but we need, uh, we're advocating for some sort of a governance structure to help guide this work, because uh, um, we need the representation of our movements in uh, the choices that we make as to what data to focus on, what types of technology to develop for this. Um, so obviously, when we talk about mapping, we, probably it should be straightforward for folks in this room, but there needs to be very, very clean separation of the data that we want to share from the mapping applications. So that's a, that's a very important, obvious, obvious thing to do. Um, and we are advocating linked open data as <laughs> a technology to use for this. Um, it is kind of, as you can see there, kind of, it is seen as kind of a, a, the five-star approach um, the, the five-star quality of open data, um, but obviously it comes with lots of, of challenges because uh, it asks a lot of the users and developers to, to, to use it. So it does have, does have issues, but we're hoping that these issues will, kind of through this steering group that we're looking at creating, we can sort of hammer those out and work out, well, first, is, is it the right approach, or is it maybe a, uh, a linked open data light approach might be, uh, might be appropriate. But that's what we need to find out to, together. Yeah, so, and now we need to find out whether those, so the, the details of, of, our, um, of our proposals, kind of we can talk about a bit more in the, in the follow-on session, and only time will find out whether the weaknesses that we think are being addressed by our, our approach um, will, will actually address those. Um, so yeah, so what, what the kind of things that we think we need to sort of govern in this project, kind of it's, it's from st sort of standards protocol evolution. Um, uh, where should we be? We're spending our time, um, obviously deciding what kind of software we should be developing together, um, and mediation. There are there are tensions in in, in all communities, uh, and you know, particularly we're aware of one uh, one tension between different uh, approaches to taxonomies, um, and we need a space where we can get together and and, and then discuss which uh, what what are, what are good choices to make. So, a, a a platform where we can get and discuss these these things are is and, and mediate differences. Um, so here's a, a, a snapshot of just five different um, uh, approaches, to, uh, five different organizations that are publishing data about the solidarity economy. Um, so at the moment, um, we're, yes, we're working with .coop. We have published, um, uh, Coops UK or have been for the last few years publishing top quality uh, uh, open, open data on the Coops that they're aware of in the UK. Um, and we have sort of published that as linked open data using a standard that we inherited um, from another project, which is the ESS Global um, Schema. Um, so yeah, so rather than talking any more about details, if this kind of stuff, you know, if you're interested in these kind of problems, uh, you've got something to offer, it's, it's, it's more than just technology needs. There's a tons of soft skills, tons of people skills required, uh, as well as, as te technology development. Um, but if you're interested in that, come to our the follow-on session. Some answers, but a lot of challenges there, I think you'll agree. Um, for, I mean, the first example of the Means for End project, which sounded so fantastic, but doesn't have any funding, so it hasn't even happened, is a great example of how this is so difficult. Um, then I think, you know, the, the dot co-op, like, it's an obvious institution to be kind of at the heart of trying to build a map for, or a directory for the cooperative space. As Tom said, like, you know, I have an email address, osb at open.coop. It kind of says who I am and what I do all in one go. So to me, that would be a really useful piece of information if everybody else had similar. We could identify ourselves very clearly and easily. And if that institution was to work with Co-ops UK and Co-ops Europe to do the same kind of thing, then to my mind, we'd kind of be halfway there. But there's a few questions popped up here, um, and Laura raised some of the sort of challenges, really, about what are we trying to map and how are we going to do it. So a lot of the maps that Laura showed were about technology projects. Personally, my interest is in more, is in mapping the individuals that are involved in this movement, because I think they are the people, they are, they are the nodes, if you like, that we need to connect. The actual people need to know where to find the other people so that they can talk to them and ultimately trade with them. However, GDPR doesn't make that very easy anymore. So we had this, we put together a big call where we talked about some of these problems and challenges, and Ultimately, we kind of agreed that to start by trying to map individuals is just too hard and too prone to abuse. But to map organizations 
is not and is probably the most obvious step to take. So to start with, really, where, what we're gunning for is kind of what Colm has, uh, has described, is a map of all the organizations working within the cooperative and solidarity economy, you know, be they social enterprises or whatever type of uh, legal structure they are, as long as they're fulfilling some of the objectives of, of our progressive movement. So that's what we're interested in. How we get there remains to be defined um, by all of us, because as we've seen, they, you can't do a half-hearted mapping project. If you do, and as Laura said, like if the data isn't kept up to date, then what's the point? Uh, it would just be worth nothing. So I think, and I mean, I'm not trying to advocate uh, linked open data or not, but we had this conversation with uh, Art Brock from Holochain, who pointed out that Back in the day when you made your website and you wanted it to be found by a search engine, you had to submit it to Demos to get it listed and eventually it would pop up and you'd have a listing there on Ask Jeeves and it was hours of fun. Um, then Google came along and created spiders which went around and found all the websites and pulled them into their index. So the game changed and we no longer needed to go and put ourselves on the map, we would just get found and automatically we were on the map, right? So Art said to me, the idea of actually having a map that you need to go and put yourself on is just redundant. Like, that's not how this thing is going to be achieved, right? It's going to be achieved by creating a simple shared schema, some sort of standard to which we all agree that we can publish this information about ourselves. So I had this conversation with Simon Grant yesterday, right after the Holochain session. He was saying, what would you like to build on Holochain? And I said, really, just... I'd like to publish my own personal file about me that would just say name, Ollie, telephone number, 0796, email address, and then any other elements or attributes about me. It might be my address, might be my date of birth, might be my bank account number, might be all sorts of other personal information. And then what I'd like to be able to do would be to specify the permissions of which ones of those fields are shared with whom. So my name, I'd probably make it publicly available to everybody. My bank account number, well, I'd probably make it available to my partners in my organization. And if you imagine, like, my email address, for example, could be quite sensitive, I might specify permissions as in people that I know could you contact me via that. Um, people that I don't know might need some sort of approval. And even if you think about it from marketing purposes, right, you could specify your own sets of permissions about who you would allow to market goods to you. So, for example, if it was somebody coming from a .coop domain, I might allow them to send me any marketing materials that they want. If it's somebody that's coming from a .microsoft uh, domain, then I might choose to charge them £10 to email me. And that is the kind of uh, place where I think we want to get to. Quite how we get there, I, I think, remains to be defined and will be the whole uh, part of this next working session. Um, that said, we don't have very long to try and cover some of the questions. Um, a lot of them seem to be statements. And I'm going to leave these up so that as you go into the next session, if you want to use some of them, maybe even copy and paste them out, because we might have some other questions arrive in here at the end of the session. Um, the last one I just wanted to say there from ad infinitum. Uh, the URL is wrong in the first one, but it's right in the second one. So going right to the top, though, Simon Grant's uh, first question uh, is about what would this map be representing? Well, I think I've sort of answered that a little bit, but I mean, it's a very big general question. Um, how do we define the relationships that we're trying to put on the map? I think it's probably not one we're going to be able to now write down here, so maybe we skip on and we'll save that one for the next. Um, can we start with an ontological meta map first, not for the faint-hearted? Anybody want to? <laughs> okay. Um, I would probably say, no, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> so, let's pick a good one here. A lot of these are comments and not questions. Okay, let's take Weiston's question. We want to map because there were so many co-ops co and solidarity projects, and we need a way to find and organize them. We've just heard three different mapping projects. Could we end up with a multitude of maps and still not know where to start? Uh, Colin? Okay, yeah. uh, there's no problem with having a multitude of maps, because the map's going to have different purposes. 
you want to basically show different, different things. Kind of, it could be as simple as just filtering different data sets to express different things that you're interested in. So there's no problem with, with multiple maps. What we advocate for is having um, multiple data sources about, about our movements that, to greater and lesser degrees, are interoperable. Um, and then people can then de develop different applications to pull those different data sets together and link them together. And some of them will be maps, others will be, will be different things. So lots of different maps is great, but let's try and increase the quality and the connectivity of the data um, and make it easier to write these different applications. I would, I would agree with that. I think you know, the point that Colm's advocating is that if we do have the data, then anybody who wants can go and build their own map. If it's uh, data that everybody manages individually, like in the example that I was giving, I would be happy to keep my data about me up to date, and presumably everybody else would. That's not too much of a responsibility to ask. So if people are doing that, and organizations are doing that, then you can imagine somebody in France pulling together a, a map of all the solidarity organizations within France, just sampling that bit of the data that they want, while somebody in the UK could put together a, a, a similar map, but with their own slant on it, maybe only involving UK co-ops or involving UK co-ops and social enterprises. So whoever wants to could become the map publisher if all of the data is readily available. Um. And maybe, Oliver, Go. if I may. I don't know if it's working. Hello? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so I presented this means for end project because I, I like also, also presenting things that don't work or are still around here and will work maybe one day. But we are also mapping, for instance, now um, resources to entrepreneurs, uh, available resources. And it's the same approach we take. So we map and we build a digital infrastructure in, in order to have an, a, a, an index of all these resources, integrate this index into the um, training centers and um, um, uh, umbrella organizations, uh, daily work in order for them to index in a systematic way. So we will, have, we will end up with a map of uh, pedagogical resources to entrepreneurs. And this will be, it will be great per se. If I look for a resource, I will know that in, in the UK there is this existing. But also at a meta level, it will be great to compare this map with the number, the, this map of resources, existing resources, with the uh, number of cooperatives that are also active in order to identify which sectors are uh, here, which sectors are underdeveloped or overdeveloped in, su in such countries, the relation with uh, pedagogical resources and so on. So it's all very complementary. And again, it's just a matter of, uh, of data uh, uh, exchange and visibility and standards, let's say. Um, there's a question here which says, given that every mapping project is based on a normative framework that is contested when translated into different cultural contexts, is this a project that will inevitably fail? And mapping SSE models might be more useful than mapping SSE enterprises. Anyone came to speak to that? I mean, I think that is some of the work that you've done at the Digital Life Collective, right, Laura, is more about not necessarily just mapping organizations, but some models too. Yeah, definitely mapping organizations and projects. I mean, I would agree, definitely everything is within a cultural context. And I think that's also why our approach of having an ecosystem of maps can be very powerful. We're not saying there's one truth. We're saying that each given community of practice or cultural view of the space can have a map that is useful for it and we can link that up with other maps. Um, I totally agree this space is contested and um, believe me, when we get onto the definition of what actually is tech that we trust, there will undoubtedly be debate and, and multiple views. There is no truth in this, there are different perspectives. Um, and I think we can reflect that in an ecosystem of maps where we're not trying to be too normative. But where we, yeah, sure, a set of people putting a map together are going to reflect their own context and knowledge very much. Colin. Um, yeah, and so the, I think there is a possibility that you can get kind of be oppressive by quite dominating, by trying to insist that all cooperatives follow this, this way of describing themselves. Kind of like that's, that's something we should definitely not be encouraging. Kind of different organizations and different um, federations will need to maintain the right to define their organizations and members as, as they see fit. Um, 
but the, the, the value will come from when they, but they, they, they help map how those definitions compare to others' definitions. So if there are differences between how the Argentinian coal federations describe uh, the different governance structures for, for co-ops, if they're different from the UK, COP UK's definition, that's, that's great. But if they can also say, well, actually, we, we think this type of co-op is analogous to our type of co-op um, uh, classification, then you get the, 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 the value without enforcing a single way of describing. Great. I think that's probably what we've got time for here. So um, this conversation is now going to move into the workshop space and just carry on with a view to creating this steering group about mapping. So if you want to get involved, then follow the panelists. But please thank them for their time.